call the Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission to order for uh, June 30th, 2022. This is our special meeting. Uh, D, would you do the roll call? Marlene Newman. Doug Bruce. Daniel Schlegel. Present. Sam Gasoller. Matthew Seddon. John Saunders. Here. Elizabeth Mitchell. Here. Allison Chopra. Here. Bernard Cross. Here. Duncan Campbell. Eric Ritchie. Ernesto Castaneda. Chris Thurbaum. All right. Thank you, Dee. Um, I need a motion to approve the minutes from June 9th's meeting. Seconds. I'll second his motion. Thank you. D. Daniel Schlegel. Yes. John Saunders. Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell. Yes. Allison Chopra. Yes. Bernard Cross. Abstain. Motion carried. All right. Let's move over. Uh, move on to uh, COAs. Commission review, COA 22-44. COA 22-44 um, calls for the moving of the existing house on 701 West 4th Street in the Greater Prospect Hill Historic District and building a new one in front of it. Um, the staff comments the following. The proposed solution allows for the existing structure to remain on the property and be given a, given a use. The new building would provide accessibility for the owner to age in place and comply with the massing outline and fenestrations found in the neighborhood. Staff would note that because this is a completely new building, it should not imitate the neighbors so much as to confuse passerbys. The design can be craftsman inspired, but it can take some license so as not to look completely historic. Um, sorry. So the construction, Greater Prospect Hill Construction Subcommittee um had multiple statements which were included in the packet i will read a few of them um john vitello wrote i have been in this house in my opinion the existing structure has very little historical value i think that design peter has presented looks good at the first glance the aesthetic of the front facing facade appears to conform to our guidelines i say yes and richard lewis made multiple comments I will highlight the following. My main issue concern is the Fairview Street facade. Since this is a corner lot, we have to consider both public way facades. For me, the roof lines are in conflict with one another and fall out of the period of the front facade. The gable and roof line height for the rear portion is quite shallow and broad. Then there's a weird corn connector roof from the main front bungalow portion to the rear of the house. Um, in general, I, however, I am very I am supportive of the plans, assuming the new construction meets setback requirements. And so pl planning did mention uh, about uh, concerns with setbacks, but um, that is something that the owner will have to um, talk to them. There may or may not be a need for a variance. This is the current house and its location. It is much more setback than its neighbors along the street. The kind of in the middle of the lot. The proposal calls for it to be moved from the middle of the lot to the back of the lot. And this is a proposal for the new facade. Sorry, for, sorry, not facade, for the new construction. And this is how the layout would look. So staff, all that said, staff recommends approval of COA 22-44. Um, and I always also wanted to comment as staff that this has been an ongoing conversation for many months with the owner trying to find multiple solutions to the dilemma of being able to expand his house and live in a comfortable way and do something that um, he found 
Um, I don't want to speak for him. He will have the opportunity to do that, but something that was suitable for his needs. Thank you. Um, Mr. Helovich, do you have anything to add to what this is? I have nothing to add. All right, great. Thank you. Let's do questions. Um, let's see, Bernard. No questions. Daniel. This time. Elizabeth? I have a Allison? Yep. Um, Mr. Harlovich, so you live in the house now and you're going to continue to live in the, the new structure, correct? I do not live in the house. My son Peter lives in the house. Okay, okay. And uh, he, he, won't, he won't be living in the house in the future. Okay. Um, so who owns the property? I, I do. And you're, okay, but your son lives in it, I got it. Um, but you don't plan to reside in there, like a, a homeowner residing in there for the I'm gonna reside in the new house. Okay. So the idea is to, <laughs> the idea is to move this house to the back of the lot. Right, oh, I, I see now. And I intend to use that for an art studio, and, I, and I, I'm gonna build a new house in the front of the lot, and I'm gonna live in that house. Okay, That's I got it. Idea. I got it. Thank you. That was helpful. Um, what? So I guess I know the answer now. Why the garage isn't connected um, to the house? There's no room for a garage. Uh, oh. In this. Uh, uh, I thought I saw that. Must be the old house that I was. Well, the old house has had uh, several additions put on, and so uh, the yeah. original house yeah. was. Uh, as uh, shown here, outlined in yellow. Yeah, yeah. And then I there see was that now. Uh, two additions that were put on the south side of the house, but those are going to be removed. And the, the original house will be moved to the new location. Uh -huh. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to give up my, my question to him. And who's the architect, do um, you? have questions the about the architect? The is architect. It? Well, I, I, um, I was working with Mark Cornett uh, as we, to lay out the property. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark uh, is having health issues. And so I took it over uh, on my own. So okay. all the drawings that you see, aside from the one on the left, they belong to me. I, they're my drawings. Okay, got it. So he was just in on like the preliminary phase. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Right. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Duncan. Uh, I just have kind of a planning question. Is there a, you know, I know we permit accessory dwelling units to be built, but what happens when you have two houses on a lot? I mean, is planning going to? That's a good question. Invo get involved in this? Because it's not really an AD in the normal sense. Yeah, well, he's going to turn it into an accessory unit, so the use will change from house to studio. Um, but that's a really good, I'm going to write that down because unfortunately. Um, we don't have the answer. We don't have a planner. There's a time conflict with the planners right now, so. Have you have you talked to planning about what happens when you leave a house on and want to build another one? No, I, I started here, and this is as far as I've gotten. But I think that's that's a good question. I've kind of asked myself that question, and you know, it, when we you take a long view on this, uh, in what happens, you know, 50 years from now? So, so I I just I think that probably. You may be right that when the house is relocated, maybe it should be designated as an accessory dwelling. On the, I, I just don't have the answer to that question. Um, planning council mentioned so this is what the feedback planning gave me for the packet. However, um, planning will give you more feedback. Unfortunately, that's not my purview, and I cannot answer those questions. When I worked with uh, Mr. Cornett, we, you know, we tried to determine what setbacks were, and he did some research on that, and uh, I incorporated those setbacks into the drawing that I provided. 
Okay. So, um, can I continue this for a second? Um, so the house you, you would move to the back, Peter, is more than 580 square feet. Well, the house, the original house is, is 570 square feet. Without the additions? Without the additions. Okay. Yeah, so it fits. So you'd fit into the AD. And then roughly, uh, the combined uh, structures are about a third, slightly more than a third of the total area of the lot. Allowable. So Allowable. I, I think they comply also. But why would it need to be an ADU? Well, you know, because we're really have only concerned with the outside of the building. You can't have a build toilet and shower and sink, so you could run it out with you ever. Well, it could be, could be uh, okay. you know, it could be a house, uh, it, it could be a dwelling, if you, if it could be a small It's uh, got the utilities. As oh, oh, yeah, it will oh, have its own uh, little function. Uh, water, sewer, uh, uh, okay. all the connections that uh, an cool. independent building would have. Okay. Um, does Mr. Dixon perhaps have anything to say about the I don't, I don't have an answer for that question right now about okay. yeah, I'm for the planning and planning council for that. Okay. But is that under a purview by planning and what their decision is from here? No, the way that the ordinance reads is, is that whoever has the more restrictive um, ordinance uh, controls. So uh, in theory, you could approve something, but planning could come back and say we're more restrictive on what we're going to do, and that's going to take that away. Yeah, I asked the question because there's no sense going through this whole thing. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. If it can't, if it can't be, if it's illegal, right. <laughs> basically. Right. All right, um, and I, I don't have any questions for you at this point. Um, if we don't have anybody online, do we? Uh, from uh, anywhere. I don't see anybody. Um. Yeah, I don't think we have any of our commissioners online today. So I, I have a question. Yeah, Bernard. Maybe he was asking before, maybe it's covered by we don't have the information. But are we concerned with what the building is used for as the HPC? No. So it could be anything. It could be a garage or a storage unit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be an ADU. Correct. Okay. See, that was part of why I asked, because if he's going to use it as a studio, I'm not sure that's a permitted use under the AD law. It has to be an accessory dwelling unit, or at least that's what I think. So when you add a, you're basically adding a building to a lot that can't be split. If, if you said, I want to build another house on this lot, they'd say no. So <laughs> it's almost like, like what I'm wondering is if you have to get rid of the original house in order to do this, and then we're getting into some mm -hmm. issues you don't want to get into, like right. removing a historic house. Right. But, well, but, I mean, I've, when I bought the house, I didn't know it was a store. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, well, I'm just saying I've, I've kind of been down that road. I, I, uh, I did a lot of investigating about how I might add on to it or, you know, somehow create a space uh, for a dwelling, and uh, I just couldn't get it to pencil out. Uh, and aesthetically, it didn't work. And so I thought the better solution would be to, you know, uh, kind of save it as an art object and put it in the district where it, it can remain and be as it is and it, as it was originally constructed and remain there. So from the exterior, it'll, it'll look it, what it looks like now. And then the, the house in the front, I'm trying to adapt uh, to the neighborhood. So, so that's my goal is to yeah. no, try to keep this thing preserved, this thing preserved at the same time uh, create uh, another prop, another building that fits the neighborhood and uh, and allows me to uh, to reside there and age in place. So I I, my goal is I want to uh, I want to live in the neighborhood. That's that's uh, that's why I've made a proposal. Yeah. Leonard, I, I think I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but. We're concerned with preserving the building. 
I don't think our concern extends to how the building is used. And once a building is being preserved, and we have no problem with how it's being preserved, why is this an issue? It shouldn't be. I would agree with you. What we're looking at tonight is not only that, but we're also looking at the proposed plans where he wants to build on that lot. Right. So that's the other component to what we're doing tonight. But I mean, I mean, <coughs> I, I think where we're getting <coughs> caught up, it's, right. I'm still thinking of this building as a house and we're building another house on the lot. It's a building and you're putting another building, building on the lot. And so if the building is technically not a house, then it really would only have one house on the lot. So it really isn't an issue. Can I respond to that? Please. So I understand both points of view. Duncan does bring something quite important, um, but it's something that planning can answer, not us. So. It is an important, that's why we sometimes, when we can, have a planner, but that um, is not the case right now. Um, however, all of these cases will go to them, and if it doesn't work out, then they will come back to us with either, they, there might either be a variance issue or there might have to be a new proposal. So the question makes sense because the case might go to planning and then come back to the HPC for another solution. Or, or um, yeah, that so it might go there and back, or it might just go forward and have other processes with them. So I can't answer to any of the planning questions. N none of us can. We can only answer to hand and historic preservation question. That said, um, yes, if if planning is more restrictive and then they say oh you can't do this because of whatever reason then it might be kicked back to us in the future to find another creative solution so yeah there is a back and forth and I understand both points of view um, unfortunately we're dealing with with the hands we are dealt with at this moment and hopefully everybody will have patience as we work through this process does, does that clear clarify a little the situation or not at all? <laughs> I think that, that does need to clear. I don't see any reason why we couldn't approve. And if it comes back, we can approve again and, mm -hmm. and work with them. I, I'm excited about this project. I think we should yeah, we, you know, support them if we can in the best and easiest way. All right. Let's move on to comments. Renard. Daniel. I'm just grateful you're willing to work with us and try to save the building. So I think trying to come up with a creative solutions is uh, a great way to go about this. So. Thank you. Yeah. Elizabeth, any comments? No. Okay. Allison? Already made mine. Uh, Duncan? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've seen this project and I've talked to Peter about it and I, and I, I haven't seen this solution, but um, I have a little trouble taking a historic house and moving it off its site of origin. So in a historic district, you're not just protecting the building, you're protecting the site and the adjacency. And if, if every time somebody wanted to put a new house on a lot, we just moved the existing historic house to the back, what kind of preservation is that? So I, my comment is that it's, it seems, as much as I understand your purpose, I, I'm having trouble with taking the primary objective of our purpose, which is the house, and making it a secondary or tertiary building on the back and completely replacing it. Um, it's better than losing it altogether, if if but that's really not our choice. So that my comment is that I have, I'd almost rather see the original house left in place and the and the new house built in the backyard, and face Fairview Street. But you won't build this house there because there's not room. There's no room for it. See, the problem is, it's been a problem all along. Yeah, it's a big problem. It's just the way the house is sited. It's just. Or, or leave the original house there, take the additions off, and build a real addition that is a decent one instead of those 
ones that yeah, were there. Yeah, I, I looked at that, but then that was that. You know, how do you combine uh, something that I would find uh, architecturally interesting on the back of that house? Yeah, I mean, I mean the I, house is part of the problem is that nobody really likes the existing house very much. That's exactly right. <laughs> but that's really not our job. I mean, we're, we're not here to decide whether the, uh, the aesthetics this, is, this has been declared a historic house in a historic district, and it, it meets a mid-century modern requirement for that. It's, it's contributing. It's not one of the most significant houses in the neighborhood. Nevertheless, it's protected just like all the other houses are. So you see where it puts us. And that's, that's my comment. I, I, it's, hard for me to, it's hard for me to approve of picking up the object of our purpose and making it into a secondary object and then building a new house. Well, are you saying then that would, that would you prefer that it was the primary object? I mean, could it be moved to the front of the lot and something be built in the back? I mean, Maybe you and I talked about build, moving it up to the setback of all the other neighbors, which would give you a much larger lot in the back. Take the additions off, but then your art studio is it's in the front. The, the is it, is in mean, the, it's in the primary sure location. The yeah, they're all, it's, I'm not saying it's an easy solution, but I'm, I'm just saying that I, I think the job of the commission is generally to protect the primary building, not to reduce it, not to make it a secondary building. And then if we did that, imagine all the way down the street and imagine the precedent it sets for any developer who wants to come in and build a lot more square feet and just move whatever small houses to the back. I mean, the neighborhood is different all, all, all overnight. So it's that's what's that's where I'm well, having I my trouble. This, this is this is a very unique. Uh, you know how many times location. you've heard that? I mean, there's not. <laughs> you know, you've walked around the neighborhood. There's yeah. there's no other house that's that far off the lot line or, or the front the, the yeah. streetscape. There's no. There's no other property that I've seen in this neighborhood or in any of the joining neighborhoods that's cited so poorly. Well, it's cited it because it was built mid-century, and that's the way they were citing mid-century houses. So it actually is historically significant that it's cited that way. So, you know. Well, if it, if it is, then show me another one. Well, it, there aren't there any are other no, ones, Peter. There aren't any other ones because that one was built at the time it was built, and they all the rest of them were built, you know, 75 to 100 years earlier. That's the difference. That's the architectural meaning difference. So that's what we're supposed to protect, and you want you want to take it out and move it off. So mm -hmm. that's where I'm that's why I'm commenting what I'm commenting because well, that's I mean, what I think I, the, that's the problem for me. Thank you. I'm not thank saying they're not going to approve it. I'm just yeah, saying I mean, that's just, the problem. I just think we, I just think that. Um, I think he wants me to. It's okay. Well, Calm down. <laughs> Great. I'd like I'd like to. Bernard, make, you have another oh, question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I've heard the exchange, and there was mention that there was discussion of moving it towards the the front towards 4th Street yeah. and building something in the back. But if it's a corner lot, couldn't yeah. you move it to the back and have the entrance on Fairview okay. and still achieve the, the, the plan so you just make a new entrance on Fairview? You, you so can, technically you, you it's... Can't alter the, you can't alter the... the orientation? The... the the front of the house, or any side of the house that you see from the street. No, all I'm saying is, instead of the entrance being on 4th Street, where I think it is now, the entrance would now be on Fairview. It's still to the back of the lot. You're just going to turn it sideways, and then you still achieve the same thing. It's just that the orientation I, of the building would be I think changed that, by 90 degrees. I think that that solution conflicts with what Duncan just uh, problem that Duncan raised. I mean, I've, I've, looked, we don't all have that I've looked at this in a lot of different ways, you know, adding to the house, yeah. moving to the house in the front, moving to the house to the back. But I'm trying to see this in the scope of the neighborhood. And 
and I want to take a longer view. You know, let's not talk about the uh, next decade. Let's talk about the next hundred years. Uh, you know, uh, I'm proposing to build. I think would be a very interesting addition to the neighborhood that uh, would will will uh, preserve the house that we already have, and it'll contribute to uh, the. Uh, uh, the the um, the quote unquote develop of the neighborhood. I mean, you'll, these houses over time, these houses are going to be uh, improved. They're going to be uh, maybe they'll have additions. A lot of things change over time, and I think that the, the uh, proposal that I'm offering uh, contributes does two things. It saves, it preserves the house, and it, it'll go into the historic context. This house was moved in the year 2023, and a new house was built here, and that's that's just part of the historic record. I don't think it necessarily, uh, I think it it may conflict in the, in the uh, in the sense that you described, but I think that my willingness and my uh, my desire to keep the house and preserve it on the lot, I think it's a fair uh, exchange. May I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that you've been through all the scenarios, so it's really just for my edification. It's not a critique. Um, one option I would think is to move um, the building that's there now closer to the street and then and facing 4th Street and then uh, or and then placing the the second building facing Fairview because it is odd if you're walking down Fairview to have you know two houses facing the same direction right is, is that an option or is that well, something that is not well, I mean, I, I, it could be an option. Because um, that's, that's honestly... But, you know, when uh, I've had uh, I've had three of my family members living in this house, and mm -hmm. the, the primary way that they approach the house is off of Fairview. They park on Fairview, and they, there's a little yeah. sidewalk. Yeah. They, very, very rarely does anyone approach the house from 4th Street. Yeah, I just, I, that was one of my issues was the fact that it's a corner lot and that you have, especially the back one, looking like to the back, back street, to the back of the house. It, I mean, I, just, you know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't... That would be a little funky to me. But. I mean, uh, <laughs> my vision is that this house will, will, will look as it looks now, but uh, it'll have a uh, sidewalk, uh, possibly a fence around it, it's going to be a, a dwelling with a, an entrance on Fairview Street. But the door will face to the north, as, as it is now. Uh, any more questions or comments? Um, yes, I have another question. Is sure. it, it's a small lot, I assume, but it's kind of amazing that you can get two small dwellings on there. Um, is there any chance for like parcel, um, like a splitting the parcel into two, or then they would be too small to do what you're wanting to do? I, I, Does that I can't make sense. I think we, like, like, would that be a setback issue? No, I think we go back to planning and we have to talk to them to see if they'll allow us to, to okay. divide the lot. It's probably a plan commission, too. Right. Very I'm just thinking, trying so to if they will think allow, uh, that, that might. That could very well be an option to divide it into two parcels. I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, this is where I'm starting, so. Okay. I had to start somewhere. Okay, any more? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, my, name is, getting there. my name is Chris Valiant. Uh, I have two, two houses in the Prospect Hill neighborhood, one of which I moved into the neighborhood from outside of the neighborhood. Um, <coughs> I just wanted to comment that on the, the, the time that I came to the meeting to request to move that house into the neighborhood, uh, there was another um, petitioner that had a property across from the Hopscotch uh, coffee shop that had 
three lots with a house in the center lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was requesting full demolition. And I believe at the time, Duncan, your uh, recommendation from him was to relocate that house uh, for him to be able to use the three lots. I think he didn't end up relocating and I think he ended up redoing it. But just in your comment about uh, preserving the historic nature of the, the whole lot and foundation and whole structure, I think kind of goes against what you recommended to that previous petitioner. Uh, so I just want to make that comment. Um, and the other thing is I, I've, I've done some work on this house for Peter and Peter's asked me to do the work going forward on this. And this, this house is kind of amazing to me that it even made it onto the historic registry. Um, it, it's really kind of a tar paper shack, if you will. Um, the, everything in this house, all the floor members, the roof members, everything is really undersized which adds to the challenge that Peter's had trying to come up with another <coughs> plan to incorporate this particular structure yeah. and add on to it. The roof is really low. Anything that gets very big added onto the back of it would tower above the existing roof. Um, so I just wanted to make those couple comments from a public kind of standpoint. Thank you, Chris. Do we have any other comments from the public? Um, if anybody has a comment they want to make online, can you please raise your hand using the hand function? Okay. Um, so we would entertain a uh, motion. Dash 44. To approve? To approve, yes. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. D? Daniel Slagle? Yes. Don Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Bernard Cross. Yes. Motion carries. Go for it. It's been approved. Have fun with planning. Oh, and do fill out the guest form. Yeah, did you guys oh, yes. sign in for if us? You can both talk about your name and who you're representing. You can just put yeah, self first. Okay. Uh, let's move on to COA 22-45. 1210 West 6th Street. COA 22-45. Sweet, thank you. Okay, COA 22-45. Um, you guys. Okay, COA 22-45 calls for the new construction of a detached garage at 1210 West 6th Street in the Near West Side Conservation District. The oh, sorry, petitioners are, um, sorry, staff comments the following. The proposed structure conforms to the guidelines in scale and location. The vinyl siding is not recommended. However, the neighborhood subcommittee made an exception as the garage would be located away from the main throughway. Uh, staff recommends approval of COA 22-45. So the Near West Construction Subcommittee had the following comments. Um, the committee has no obje the committee has no objection to the project as proposed. The committee would like to call attention to the exception it is making to its general opposition to the use of vinyl siding within the conservation district. The decision should not be construed as a general acceptance of vinyl siding as an appropriate material in the Near West Side Conservation District. That said, they have no objection. Here are some photos of the location, proposed locations. So this is a non-contributing site. However, we are looking that, uh, to make sure that the uh, patterning, uh, the Near West Side patterning is not interrupted. As you can see, it is um, towards the back of the lot. Um, and the garage also had the dimensions. There's an extra sheet here, and I did send an addendum, so the dimensions were changed to conform to the 
planning requirement for that site. Um, so yeah, uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Renard, do you have any questions? Oh. Are there petitions here? The yes. petitions are right behind yeah. us. I thought not mine. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah. Did they have anything to add? Do you have anything to add? Okay. Not until you ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Score um, Daniel, do you have any questions? Uh, I guess I, I know I read this when Gloria sent this out, so I was trying to find out. The only question I have, and it's just out of curiosity, is why you chose to use the vinyl siding. I, I just, I'm well, just curious. The house, the house is a new house. Okay. We took possession of the house a year ago, and it was already built. We did not, you know, and so we're matching the house and keeping okay. the integrity of the look of the house with, with, uh, with the, the garage. With the garage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Elizabeth. No question. Allison? No, sir. Um, and so the house, is it vinyl sided too? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Duncan? No question. All right, uh, anybody online have questions? If you have any questions and you are online, you can use the raise hand feature. All right, hearing no questions, we'll move to comments. Bernard, any comments? I, I think my only comment is a comment on the comments by the, the, um, the board or the subcommittee on the... Near West Side? Yeah, on the Near West Side. Um, really doesn't give me anything to work with <laughs> you know they're recommending against it but they're not voting against it and they're go it's going back and forth you know <laughs> it this is just difficult to try to ascertain what it is that they're trying to communicate and you know anybody listening much clearer opinion would be appreciated. So. Okay. Well, do you have anything to comment on that? I can talk to the near west side on them comments, on their comments, if you want. <laughs> we don't want new dicta to become <laughs> <laughs> of the word of the court. <laughs> Very yeah. true. Very true. But it meets yeah. all the guidelines. I mean, it meets our it meets yeah. the guidelines for what's supposed to be there. Uh, Daniel, do you have any comments? No. Elizabeth. Don't change guidelines. Duncan. Okay. Duncan. Well, I just comment on what Bernard said. I mean, I guess I read that a little bit differently, but they're, they're saying the house was built before our guidelines were in place, so basically our hands are tied. I mean, they, they, but the, the garage is a new structure. Yeah, it is, but so they, they, don't, they, don't wanna, they don't want to come in on the accessory structure and insist that it look different from the house. So that should tell you where they're at. <laughs> it tells me where they're at. You don't have to agree with, the, with them, you know. I don't. Shouldn't but either resist a stone to figure it out. Anyway. I mean, this we get into this with new construction all the time. You, see, you know, it's something that's already there. You're pretty much trapped by it. In, in, the, in the previous petition, it hadn't happened yet. Right. Now you've let it happen, so you're going to pay for it sooner or later. But. Thank you. Uh, any comments? I think your house is lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've lived in historical houses, and um, we have people that are here because we have a poor year old grandson we fell in love with, well, obviously with him, but with Bloomington and with being back in that area. So yeah. Great. Great. We, try to, we try to do good. Great. Thank you. Um, so we need a motion. I will see that one. I need another placement. Oh, I'd like to move too, please. Thank you. And this Daniel seconds. Thank you, Daniel. Dee, will you do the roll? Daniel Slagle? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. 
Bernard Cross. Yes. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you for coming in this evening. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. <laughs> Enjoy. And I like your house as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Come good. on over for a garden tour. Oh. <laughs> sure. Oh, wow. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too. All right. Get her name. Do you have anything for the community? <laughs> um, let's move on to COA 22 46, 108 East 6th Street. And I believe the petitioner is with us, Mr. Norton. Yes. Good Great. Good. Thank you. Okay. Gloria? Yes, so COA 22-46 is for the permanent sign at 108 East 6th Street in court, the Courthouse Square Historic District. During our last meeting, um, I mentioned that um, as staff, I had approved a temporary sign at this location. They are now requesting for the permanent sign. Staff comments that the sign complies with the, complies with the guidelines and location scale and materials. Uh, the sticker signs uh, to be put on the storefront do not detract from the historic building, and the, uh, they also comply with planning's uh, size percentage. Staff recommends approval of COA 22-46. Um, so here's the map, and here's, here is the location. Um, so yeah, these are... The packet has more information on the on the materials and the yeah on the materials and lighting of the sign. Great, thank you, um, Mr. Norton. Do you have any additional comments? Uh, no, it's the it's the same type of sign that was up there for Function Brewery. Um, it's called a reverse channel letter, um, and everything that I everything on the uh, paperwork I submitted is what we're proceeding with, of course. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I just realized I walked by this on my way over here. So oh, I, no. yeah, so I just saw it. Great. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have any questions? No, I don't. It's pretty obvious to me what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Allison? Um, well, I'm going to make sure that I don't assume it's obvious, but that's uh, painted black. Is that correct? Behind the sign? It's a, it's a it's a dark brown it's yeah it's dark brown but it's okay. the same it'll be the same surface that's there now right I um, guess I'm I'm wondering if there was any uh, discussion about the fact that there's that sort of forest green up top um, on the building like the next the second floor uh, where that picture go if you there's another picture in there that'll show you what I'm talking about. Yeah. Where, where the picture? Is it this one, Allison? Yeah, you can kind of see it in that picture. That, that's green up there, and there's also some green on the top of the building. Is that correct? Um, these, so yeah. the photos we sometimes use, just to clarify, um, for the packet purposes are sometimes drawn from Elevate or from Google, and sometimes mm -hmm. they're a little older, so there might have been some changes and stuff. Perhaps. Um, the petitioner can answer that question. I'm, I'm not understanding your question. I'm sorry. So currently, uh, the the paint color behind Metalworks Brewing Company um, is actually what did you guys say? Like a brownish or, or yeah. no? So yeah, this yeah. is sort of a brownish gray. But before this, if you look at that picture, it was it, it's green. Do you see that picture? Well, and the, there's well, green up top. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, what's there? Yeah, what's there now is not changed. We are matching. What you see there now is what was behind Function Brewery. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're not changing that color. Okay. Great. That that was my question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and I have no questions with this one, uh, Duncan. No. Okay, so let's move on to comments. Uh, Allison. Um, no comment. Elizabeth, Daniel, oh, Renard, Duncan. No, I have no comments. <laughs> so we need a motion. Oh wait, yeah. sorry. Any public comments? If anybody in the public who is online has a comment, they can use the raise hand function.
All right, hearing no comments, uh, we need a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. <laughs> All right, D, will you do the roll? Daniel Slagle? Yes. Don Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Bernard Cross? Yes. Motion carried. Terrific. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you uh, thank you, Bruce. All right, <clears throat> let's move on to uh, COA 22-47, 916 East University Street. So COA 22-47 and 916 East University Street in the Elm Heights Historic District is, um, the petitioner is requesting to replace the back deck and add a screened in door. Um, so staff comments the following the porch replacement faces the back of the property and is technically visible from a right of way due to an unvacated yet overgrown alleyway. So it really isn't visible from the main throughway. The design is compatible with the house and provides a functional second story deck for an existing doorway. Staff recommends approval of COA 22-47. Um, as I send all of these to planning, um, they just um, mentioned that the porch needs to be six feet from the property line. If they are maintaining the same western wall, it can be four feet. This is just so that the um, owner slash petitioner is aware when they go to planning. This is the location of the site. So that's the deck that they are, that the petitioner wants to change. This is the proposed look. The columns would not be this way at all. Um, they would be straight wooden um, posts, but the screen doors would be uh, this type of color material and wood. And the, there's also, yeah, railing designed for the back steps because there is a bit of a height difference and how the doorways would open and close um, using a rolling system. Yeah, so that's it. Okay. I take it away. I did not hear back from Elm Heights. Just letting Perfect. you know. <laughs> I did reach out. Uh, Ms. Spencer, do you have any additional comments? You might want to mute her. Is he mute her? I'm sorry. I'm trying to. Uh, are you with us, Mrs. Spencer? Miss Spencer? Um, she logged in. She shows muted to me, but. Yeah, let me. You don't have the back door over there. Chat. Send a message. Can't do much more. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Do you have any additional comments for us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can no. hear you. Okay. Um, my only comments are this this back porch is the last thing that I intend to do to the house that I've lived in for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I do not wish to change uh, the space of it. The west wall is six, well, I'd say eight to 10 feet away from the property line. Um, I'm just trying to upgrade this porch, which is in need of services. It's got dry rot and misery, and uh, the 
the railing on the top of the roof was original to the house. It hasn't uh, been there for 40 years. Would you go back to But me? I want to put it back. Um, do you have questions for me? We will here in a second. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> we'll move to questions. And uh, Bernard, do you have questions? Um, how many questions per se, but it would have been nice to have a diagram of some kind showing where the house is situated on the lot, showing the dimensions mm. of the deck. I don't see one here in my pocket. I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's just this. This is all we got. Yeah, I know. All we have is a photograph, but it doesn't show. That's where the six by ten. Six by ten, which dimension? Six, six by ten. Well, six by ten. Ten this way, six that way. We're assuming, aren't we? Mm, but one second. It just would have been nice to have a diagram. But I think Gloria's going to pull us up one. Oh, you got one. Well, that's not really, but I can do the next best thing. Mm -hmm. Is <coughs> University. Oh, there we go. So, so this image up there shows the house. This would be the the deck and it doesn't show its relationship to the whole yard um, unfortunately elevate you could see more or less it would be located around right there so this is not ideal but this is the best I can do in short notice okay I'm sorry I'm having trouble hearing you just because I don't hear that well um, um. Okay, we are we are looking at the lot, right? And the relationship of the deck to the lot. Yes. Okay. Does that uh, work for you? No. Your head? Just trying to make a comment about stuff. Okay. That's, uh, good enough. Daniel, do you have any questions? The same kind. Of. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah. Allison. Question. Yeah. Um, no. Duncan? May I make another statement? Uh, yeah, we're in questions. Hang on a second, uh, Jane. We'll get back to you. Okay. And, and I don't have okay. any questions. And we're going to move to comments right now. So. But Duncan, does, oh, have Duncan question. does have a question. My question is, where's the design for the new porch? Where is the design? I mean, I, I see. I don't. I don't need to talk to her necessarily. But I, I see that there are pictures of somebody else's porch here. But I don't. Right. But is your porch going to look exactly like this one, except for the stone pillars? Exactly it like is. it. Exactly it's like it. Because there's gonna no. It's going to look like that. It won't have arts and crafts pillars. It will have the original. Um, uh, Tudor revival um, pillars that, oh no, oh no, done speaking. Well, my question is that, I mean, I see that there are design references here, somebody else's porch. And I, I can I can eliminate the arts and crafts battered columns, but she says she wants sliding doors, and then she shows us another picture of another porch, a different porch that has sliding doors. So I don't know what she's going to build. I'm not against. I have nothing against her screening in her porch or doing. I pr probably would love whatever it is she's going to do, but we have to be able to see what's going to be done. We can't approve a C of A and. The, and this goes back to Peter Horolovich's thing, where we got absolutely no details on that house. No windows, no siding, no roofing material, nothing, and, and do pass. And that's just wrong, you guys. Yeah. Yeah, we gotta, you you can't do, that's not the way this is supposed to work. 
And I'm sorry. I... She's having a problem. Well, the problem so is we need to. So what we can do is deny this petition and ask her to go back and bring us design of what's going to be in place. I assume that we have a guideline of what they need to do. I mean, when they have a petition, we would say, okay, this is what you need to include in your packet. Yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> there it is. Am, am I still on? Yes, yes you are. Okay, the sliding doors are for me. I'm planning the last, the last part of my life. Realize I've been here for four years and I have never done anything that wasn't historically accurate to this house. The sliding doors are only so that my uh, titanium hips can get down the stairs without tripping on a door that just flips out. The fact that the doors would, would just go back into the screening will just make it safer for me. And since I have the reason I want to screen this porch is because I have fawned on my porch all the time and other wildlife, and I would like to not have that in my last years. Um, there is nothing I'm doing or suggesting that would compromise the integrity of this home. I've lived here for 40 years and I have lived in Elm Heights in historic sites for 50 or 60 years. Um, so I'm not understanding why you would want to stop me from doing this. It's really just screening in a porch and adding on the balcony on the top, which was there in the 40s and 50s when Harry Day lived here. Uh, we're not asking that. What we're asking for is you to submit uh, plans and materials to be used in the construction or changing I of the porch. The, that's in the, that's in the, that's I, I told you the materials in the, um, in the thing that I sent in, the thing that I had to write out because I don't use computers anymore. Okay. It's all going to be, uh, you know, done in a uh, cedar, cedar, uh, kind of thing, and really, this porch is an eyesore. I'm happy to put the money into changing it because it, this house deserves it. Um, but I don't know what you want from me. What, it, what is it me? you want to address that? Yes, um, so what the... If I'm interpreting correctly, um, the HPC would like to see a drawn version of your written description. So a scale drawing, an elevation, and a plan that shows a combination of, that shows exactly what you want. So it shows what you've, what you've shown us with the images but how it would look like yeah. more exactly in your house. Did you get that? Yeah, I'm not really understanding that. I think you have everything that you need to have. You, you're, you're suggesting I need to get an architect to draw a picture? A draw, you could use um, graph paper and one foot equals a block or a square and to just more or less get get a drawing. It's, it's listed here on that. 
for yeah, it. It says, it says, yeah, it's on, it says clearly attach a drawing or provide a picture of the proposed I did modification. Provide a picture. No, you provide you provided a picture of somebody else's porch, which is not the exact same porch that you're building. If it was the exact same porch, then I'm not going to change the. I mean. I'm building on the slab that was here 98 years ago. There's nothing different. I'm just screening it in. And I am putting enough money into doing this project that the I and I'm 73. I can't I can't build you a little a little thing. You're not seeing right there. I can't, I'm sorry. Let's have her come in Right. Yeah. I did. A consultation with Gloria. Oh, what do you think about that? Yeah, whatever. I think it's easy to explain yeah. what it is that we require in a one on one rather than going back and forth in the sense of. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> How do you want to proceed at this point? Then? Okay. Then. You okay with that, Daniel? Well, the only question I was going to ask, procedural question, is to ask how much time is on this petition. These are all expiring this week. Okay, so they either need an agreed continuance or a denial to resubmit. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so. Would you make a motion I mean, at this point? Because I think we've done it comments. That we not approve it. <laughs> we, have yeah, we done yeah. some comments? No, I have no more comments. Okay. Daniel, any comments? No. Elizabeth? No. no I, don't have I know, I do. You have a comment? Um, there's a set of guidelines that, unfortunately or fortunately, whether you like historic districts or not, um, must be followed. I lived I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, ma'am, I'm commenting right now, please. Yeah, I'm going to do Okay. That you run up into, there's benefits and, and frustrations with um, having a, a historic area, but I mean, unfortunately, you, you can't have everything without making sure that the rules are followed. And I am adamant as someone who's just recently run for judge that everyone be treated uh, the same and if we get any applications um, yeah, no, that, that aren't I'm sorry I know you ran for judge well I was just saying that like my ethos are in just and fair um, procedure and so that's why I said that so that you know kind of where where my values are um, and I value that and I think on this committee we should we should be upfront and clear and make sure that like we have rules and we're following them. Otherwise there's no point in having them. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for my welcoming the comment. Yeah. Um, any other comments? All right, hearing none. Can I get a motion? I'd I'd move to deny the petition at this point. Obviously the um, petitioner can renew. Second. Okay. D Daniel Slagle. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Yeah. Bernard? Say oh, Elizabeth? She said yes. Yeah. Okay. Allison Chopra? Yes. Bernard Crump? Yes. Yeah. Motion carried. All right, good enough. Let's move on. What did you just decide? I don't really understand. We decided to deny your petition, and we're asking that you go back and provide us with a drawing and type of materials that will be used. Uh, Gloria. 
Jane, Jane, um, Jane, this is Gloria. I will call you tomorrow. I will work with you, okay? okay I will work with you on this. This is really disturbing. Goodbye. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to COA 22-48, 521 West 4th Street. Uh, are the petitioners with us? Five twenty one. Petitioners Jerry Center and Sarah. Are they here? If the petitioners are online, can they please raise their hands? Okay, for solar panels. All right, so we need to move on. Yeah, there's something has to be done. Sorry. So, sorry. So they applied on June 9th? Yeah, I think they need to be here. They need to be present in COAs. Mm -hmm. Is that what the code they says? They've got to be here for COAs. They don't have to be here for demolition. Demolition. Delay. Hmm. So we'll hear demolition delays about, but you guys can show for COA. Hmm. We do invite them for the demo. Yeah, as well. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did they, they got notification of the special meeting, I assume? I hope so. I can check. Let me stop share. Check my email. Well, they're not here. And can we move them up to the next meeting? No. Does that mean they'll have to reapply? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, I mean, does the HBC deny it or does they, or, the, or the next is it considered moot? Hmm? Uh, July 14th, so I think. Okay. Okay. All right, so. I will need the motion for COA 22-48 to deny. I make a motion to deny. Second. Thank you. 2248. And Daniel seconds. D. Daniel Slagle. Yes. Is that, did you say yes? Yes. Okay, sorry. And um, John Saunders. Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Renard Cross? Yes. Motion carried. All right, thank you, Dee. All right, let's um, move on to uh, new business. Okay. So, new business. Um, Peerless has requested the $500 BHPC grant, uh, consulting grant. Um, as a reimbursement for um, the consultation that RC did for the smokestack work. Um, staff recommends approval of BHPC grant 2202 as it would help in some way offset the cost of this report. The report that you all saw cost them $20,000, so it really won't go super far, but anything can help so yeah i uh staff does um recommend the approval for that they are also going up for the buea grants they will be their case will be seen on july 6th that is wednesday at noon in this very room they are requesting fifty thousand dollars which is above the normal but also considering that that work will cost above three hundred thousand dollars to do because they want to do a careful it's not even like your typical demolition but they are going to be taking it apart carefully um, with consideration for the remaining structure so yeah that's where we're at right now as staff and i will leave it to you uh, what are the parameters that we're looking at for this grant and are so, they here so um 
they don't have, I don't believe they have to be here for the grant. Um, yeah, no, were. that's good. The parameter is that it be in the, they were. yeah. So for the BUEA, there, so these wow. are two grants. I know the BUEA. So, so they're in the mm -hmm. BUEA a zone. Right. Um, so the BUEA is currently working on that grant. And it already has the C of A, or COA as we call it, mm -hmm. um, from here to mm -hmm. do the partial demolition right. or, or stable, stable, stabilization process. The BHPC grant, which is our, our internal grant, is for the consultation by an expert who has been vetted either in a state list that the Department of Natural Resources has or by HPC staff. HPC staff has, through research and uh, contact with RSC, determined that they have vast experience working with consultation of historic, as an engineering firm of historic structures throughout all of Indiana. They have a lot of experience and did a careful job with this project. Um, so that's basically the main determination. It has to go to offset the cost of consultation for the facade work. Um, because really the HPC, we only, our only area um, is the exterior of buildings, so. Sure. So when you say that they've had extensive work reviewing historic preservation buildings and sites, I mean, they do a ton of business, so um, it's not that they're in the preservation industry, per se, it's that they end up doing a lot of historic preservation reports because they're doing business. Would that be fair to say? I mean, all <laughs> preservation firms are in the business of construction as well. So, yes, it's fair to say, but that they have uh, people specialized in the more careful work that preservation requires. Um, not every architectural or engineering firm has the... Um, takes the close look at certain, there are certain things and rigors that preservation requires, such as the wear and tear of metal, of brick, and how to work with it carefully, you know, without bulldozing or anything like that. Um, right. Then not I mean, every firm, yeah, and obviously so. Obviously, they have an interest, which is their business building. All right, I mean, their interest is making money off of their construction. Yes, um, but they've already been paid for by the, by, so this I mean, would be a reimbursement to Peerless. No, no, I get it. I'm just saying, here's the thing. I'm not really excited to give, about giving them money because if I recall, they were not especially interested in working with the city on this project. And they weren't real flexible. They were a little flippant about some things. And so... That's where I'm coming from. Yeah, if I might add uh, mm -hmm. to Gloria, um, so they, RC, so when we issued the unsafe order on the smokestack in January, um, RC came in as sort of a, mm. because they're a very specialized uh, structural engineering firm that knows how to look at smokestacks, I think. They were, they're pretty, they're fairly few organizations out there that know that have that expertise so that report that they did the $20,000 report um, helped um, catalyze the rest of this so okay. that was sort of they so were it wasn't peerless's report well, no, it, no. well it was it was peerless paid RC to do the report for them because what had to happen we, we, right. we determined the stack to be unsafe based on RC's previous report back in 2018 Believe. And it said it's got structural issues, and it's this, it's that, it's, you know, you're going to have to do lots of things to it. And that report then, three years later, needed to be updated to say what exactly needs to happen now that the city's deemed it unsafe, what's the latest, what actually needs to happen. So that report sort of helped determine, put some structure around what could happen to it next, and then the HPC took up the COA and all that. So we can't got, go ahead. give the grant to RC. No, because the owner, um, I mean, as I understand it, the owner, the petitioner is the owner of the property, and they had already paid um, to have the report done that we sort of 
told them they had to do because right. because the, there was no way I mean, the city hasn't qualified you know we, we, we're not structural engineers that could have made the assessment about here's what has to happen with the smokestack so RC came in at the cost of peerless to and come in and do that so that's, not good. that's and these, kind of their ex, where, where their expertise came in I and guess. these grants are always reimbursements they're not paid yeah. beforehand anyways um, right now there's another issue and it is that peerless they are the custodians of this property. They are the main stakeholders, and they are the ones who are taking care of it. And uh, what one of the ways that we could also look at it is it's not a lot of money, but goodwill towards the building can be a type of exchange or a type of currency that goes a long way. Sorry, who's, who's getting this money? So, is, is the, it's peerless. It's, it's peerless. Peerless, yes. Construction company. So, no, the owners of the, the property. The owners, the property. yes. Property. Yeah. But it is. They want the money to help pay for a report that they were required to do. <clears throat> so we, we issued an unsafe order, which. So, it's a cost of doing business then? Mm -hmm. You could say that, sure. <laughs> um, so, there's so, my problem. The DUEA grant, we don't have any say over. And that's a facade grant, so I don't know that the BUEA is going to let them use it for anything else. That we, those those were instituted years and years ago. I've participated in several of them. They're specifically for facade restoration in the downtown mm -hmm. or in the BUEA zone. Ten k. Okay, yeah, and it's yeah. A roughly ten thousand dollars. So I'm not even sure that's a correct application of that grant. But that BUEA can make up their own money. The BHPC okay. consulting grant has been to hire a preservation consultant to assist somebody in their effort to restore the building. So it's pretty stretchy, I think, to use it as a reimbursement for work that's already been done. This, this, this is specifically, and I've done several of these where the owner says, I'm not really sure, I want to restore, but I'm not really sure what to do. And I sketch them a traditional storefront and say, this is what it used to look like. And I get paid $400 and everybody's happy. And that's the way it's been done. So. I'm not sure this is the, this certainly isn't the way it was intended to be used. Now, that's, you know, that's mm. my sense of the history of the, of, of the grant. So, and I have to agree that I think what their expenses have been have been the cost of doing business. I mean, you know, I don't see that there's any onus on us to reimburse them for it, frankly. I mean, again. It, it, that's Sorry. not the way these grants, these, either one of these grants was intended to be used. Did you, did you send out something on this or are you just tabling it now? So, I, no, I, I just I mentioned it in the, I mentioned it in the, in the agenda. Okay. I would like to yeah. see something, some, some document, like I'd like to see the, the reference material Okay. I'd like to see what it is. Yeah, I'd like to see what it is that they're applying for. Okay. okay. Is, I mean, I can attach. I can attach. Um, Please. For next, for the next meeting, I can bring it up right. again, along with their application form and with the whole RC report. I can bring that up again. I'm more. You know, certainly, like what Duncan just said, I'd like to see the criteria for award of, of these course. grants okay. and try and. Um, all right, well, we'll table this to our next meeting. So we move on. Well, they're going to get the BUA money because they never say no, so. Well, that's up to BUA. I know. <laughs> so you a, want money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so it looks like uh, Tim Kepper's with us. Yes. And uh, next on our agenda is uh, he would like some feedback on his design for 200 East Kirkwood. And that's in our packet. And Gloria, you got the. Yeah, I can. Um, Tim, take over. I see him online. Oh, he's gone now. Um, yeah, there he is. I see Tim. He was last last week. Yeah, there we go. What's his last name? Clover. Mm -hmm. Huh? Cover. 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 Mm. C O V E R. Oh, uh, we can't hear you. No, can't hear him for some reason. Still can't hear you. Tim, can you hear us? 
Okay. And Gory, I'm, I'm he's muted. He's unmuted. It's on your side. Uh, can you hear me if I'm yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, apparently my mic is having trouble, so I'll uh, I'll listen in with one piece and talk with the other. Okay. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking time to uh, let me introduce the 200 East Kirkwood uh, project. I know it's uh, we've we've discussed it a little bit before. Uh, if I can share here, I am going to bring an image up. And can you see an image on your screen? Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, basically, I was going to, this is 200 East Kirkwood. And just for kind of reference, uh, you can see the existing bank building kind of running my hand around it. And then Kirkwood is to the north at the bottom left of the screen. And Washington is to the right and west side. And this kind of gray box right here is the Graduate Hotel. So it goes up a couple stories and then it steps back and then goes up a uh, little over six six stories with some rooftop areas and there is roughly just for reference again about a 20 foot wide drive between the graduate building wall and the wall of the the bank building so uh, when we initially uh, spoke and we're just talking some concepts on what you could do should the building get designated uh, in terms of adding to the building. Uh, the developer had purchased the lot with the intent to add density to this location. And so uh, we talked a little bit about going vertical um, and the ability to you know build over the top of the building as well as uh, the ability to add to the south off the back of the building. So you have an alley back here. And then also the ability to potentially add between the two buildings, between the graduate and the bank building to the east. And so uh, where I started with all of this and looking at it is really that, you know, the Kirkwood facade and the Washington Street facade I saw as, um, I'll, I'll just say sacred, that those are really the, the view that you pull of this building uh, when you're walking down the street or, or driving. And so we want to basically take those two facades and put them back uh, restore them, which for the most part, there's not outside of cleaning them up and repairing windows. Um, the biggest thing on Kirkwood is taking the big red canopy off and then rebuilding or restoring the current or the original, I should say, canopy. Uh, the framework for it is up underneath that fabric canopy still. So we can get that put back uh, to the way it was. Uh, secondly, what I looked at is um, I didn't want to build out on the face of the existing building. I wanted there to be a, a distinct difference uh, between the facades. And so I have intentionally held the, the addition, the vertical addition back. And it ranges between um, about four feet to seven or eight feet, depending on where you're at, back from the facade in these elevations. And then the addition that goes, the, the all new addition uh, that starts at grade, that pushes back out to the property line, basically in line with the existing building. But again, between these two, there's a defined 
recessed section of the building that is actually the entry point for the upper part and the new addition here. Uh, the current entrance for the bank would remain. Uh, we are actually talking to another bank about coming in and we would be maintaining the, uh, the drive-through and the drive-through lane uh, that was originally there as well. So I'm going to just kind of show you what that means in plan real quick and then I'll talk a little bit more about design. Uh, so in plan, again, uh, Kirkwood is at the top to the north. The yellow box is the existing building and we're on the first level. And so we are adding on on the back side uh, to bring in an elevator and stair and we have an entry point. This is recessed back from the existing building face on Washington. Our drive through currently comes in off Washington Street about here and comes through and then turns up and heads north out to Kirkwood. Uh, we are suggesting that that gets uh, pulled off of Washington and that you enter from the alley and come under the building. Uh, part of that is really just to clean up, not have that interface on Washington Street with the public and put that, you know, point of car access back to the alley as opposed to through the middle of the, the street block. Once you come in and go under the building, um, like I said, the drive-through continues through. The original drive-through is right at this location. Um, what you see in green is been added to this building. So I'll uh, back up one step. The little black dots that you see in here and out along the side here are a new skeleton structure that would be added through the building in order to support going vertical with the with the project mm -hmm. to minimize the number of columns that are coming down through the building i've pulled the lines so one this row is off the exterior wall and off the front wall so that I'm not undermining uh, the foundations or footings for the existing building. And then I've set the third row, one, two, three, outside of the building. So again, I minimize how many I'm dropping through the existing facility. And then basically I'll have a beam line over the roof that starts here and comes across out to the outermost column. And so that would continue one, two, three, four, five beam lines. And the fifth one again is outside of the building uh, to try and minimize impacts. That structure line that is set here forces the drive, instead of being 20 feet wide, is now 12 feet wide. And in order to have the ATM and drive through window that is currently sitting here still function, I'm basically proposing a box be added under a walkway zone uh, to push out to serve that drive through. So what you're looking at on first floor then duplicates to second floor. Uh, we're still in the existing building in yellow. We are creating four apartment units on this floor. And then from that new structural system, spanning back to add a walkway, and this would be open air walkway. And you'll see that in the renderings here in a little bit. And then an expanded area for some outdoor seating at level two. And this zone serves two purposes. One, it's above, it's outdoor seating. Below, it recreates a canopy cover at the drive-through. 
Now, there was originally a canopy here. There's not much information on it that I've seen other than a aerial photo. Um, and that canopy was tore off sometime in, in history. But I thought this would be a, a symbolic way, I guess, to uh, recreate a canopy uh, for that use that occurred in the past and would occur again in the future. Uh, when you get up to the third and fourth floors, that's where you see the step back. And what I've created with that step back, just a, a small green roof zone that would be viewable from inside these units. You have the outdoor walkway and then the building addition at the south end, creating three more units. And so you just have that repeat. So from a design standpoint, again, I wanted the existing bank building to really still stand alone uh, to where you could see that building and understand that anything else was in addition to it. But for the addition itself, I still wanted to keep in terms of a more um, international feel, kind of that modern international with the, the bank shares, with a lot of glass storefront, um, use of metal, glass glazing systems, and basically man-made materials for the addition itself, and then pick up on with the storefront systems, again, pick up on the, the spacing and the lines of the existing building in that storefront. And then also kind of the rhythm down the building facade that you see on the west facade. Let me bring that up a little bit here to where, again, you have on the west facade very simple windows that are recessed in kind of a vertical section on the buildings, kind of doing the reverse on the upper building, where, again, we create those vertical columns uh, for our window zones, and those are pulled forward instead of set back. You're also seeing here then the interface between the two sides and the existing building and new building. That is set back again at seven, eight feet-ish um, from the face, and will again be more of a, a metal, uh, probably metal panel skin through here, uh, and storefront system. As you come down Kirkwood, the alley side of the building. So this is again, the graduate hotel. And then you're seeing the start of the bank building and the addition on top. And as you come a little further down Kirkwood and you get in front of the alley here, again, you start to see that stair tower element, the glazing across um, and then We've added kind of a play again on this vertical fin that is on the building itself, kind of bringing our roof structure down in that vertical fin and using it as a termination for our storefront that's coming across, similar to what's being done in the style below. Now, this is if you follow this really light line here, that's the graduate hotel, and we we basically screened it so that you can see through the building. And so this is on the east side, what has, I would say, the most impact to the existing building. So again, the building shell is right here of the existing bank building. That canopy zone, which actually extends to within a few feet of the graduate hotel so your car is coming in under the building here it kind of daylights and then you're back under the canopy and then you come out to Kirkwood Avenue the walkway systems would be left as an open air walkway system so again you're reading the building through this through this but honestly as you can kind of see in these images, 
you're really not seeing boundless alley zones because of the building or the graduate hotel. Um, let's see. Uh, when you come around the back of the building, off the alley, again, the big white kind of line here is the graduate hotel. Uh, there's about a seven foot gap right here. And you wind up again, we, we wrap that glass corner around and then you come to where we will have an entry for the drive through under the building. So there'll be some kind of uh, header across here as we develop this. So I know that's pretty quick. I'm going to kind of roll back to street view at the corner and just uh, what I'd love to do is just get your initial comments and, and feel on this so that uh, we can continue to develop it and then uh, bring it back to you, uh, hopefully for a COA. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, Duncan? Tim, what's the material on the, on the stair well? So right now I've started with a ground-faced um, CMU, uh, kind of a, a white ground-faced CMU. Uh, I haven't honestly decided fully what it wants to be. On, on one hand, I, I was looking at a contrast. On the other, I started looking at kind of the, the dark granite um, corner piece of the existing bank and whether that whole staircase would want to be kind of a yin and yang with uh, bringing that dark material back over into that, on that face. Uh, right now, I just have a panel of it and using that for more of a signage location. So, so am, I, am I right that you're considering possibly matching the granite up there or going with something much lighter? Um, the inset, either matching or uh, a similar material, whether that's, uh, you know, an exterior tile uh, that's in that dark color with that same kind of gloss. Uh, honestly, I haven't got that far yet beyond just kind of conceptual, if it made sense to kind of try and draw that material up into that zone. Uh, the fact that it's a stairwell may mean that it has to be uh, like a fireproof enclosure. It can't be glass or t more transparent. Um, I'm, ju I'm just so asking, I'm, I'm leading up to something, but I just need to ask. Uh, the, the stair itself, the components or parts of it that did not open into the building could be glass. So um, this, this face, could be glass, yeah. if that's what you're uh, looking towards. Okay. Well, one of the um, thanks for the presentation, and I I, uh, I appreciate how you've protected the primary uh, and um, west facades, and I I kind of like the way the design allows the hotel to cover it up. Uh, from view because that's that's probably the least compatible side of the building that you've just the way that's been designed with the walkways but I agree with you that we won't really see it um, one of the primary um, um, preservation recommendations when you put additions on existing historic buildings is that the addition not overwhelm the original building and I feel like this is a little bit smothering um, normally we would require a setback from the front facade of more like a quarter of the roof space not three feet but 20 feet 15 feet to try to, for one thing, to, to hide part of what's added to the top by setting it back farther from the public view, which is a person walking down the street. And it also allows the historic building to stand forward 
proud of the addition. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what, the reason I'm asking you about the stair column, um, I understand how you've integrated all of your design concepts. I like the way your entrance is recessed back to allow that corner to stand. The addition to the rear doesn't bother me at all. It's got enough reference to the original building that I think it would meet a compatibility requirement. But I'm worried about it being top heavy forward. And so anything, it's, for instance, if the stairwell went to glass or had more transparency and we lost the heaviness of that corner, that would help. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I've sat in a lot of studio crits on stuff like this and it's really hard to look at something for the first time and be very thorough and I haven't obviously thought it through and two of our architect members aren't even here today. Um, but I, I'm feeling like it's, a, it's just a little bit top heavy to the front. And I know you've got square foot issues and everybody does, but uh, I would almost rather see it reduced, that the two floors on top reduced uh, in their forward thrust and added as another floor at the back. Because if the building stacked from front to back, I feel like it would be less intrusive on the original building than it is now. And I don't, I don't, I don't know what all the height requirements and everything are, but those, those are my preliminary comments. Okay, thank you. Okay, Renard, any comments? <sighs> it just looks like every other building. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, you drive through Bloomington, I, I, I get, you, you see two basic types of design. You see something that's typically this or something that's clad in limestone. Um, I would like to see something more architecturally unique, something worthy of note in the downtown area. I mean... I know what I like and yeah. I don't like this. This is very modern history. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, I just, I guess there were questions. So if I counted right, and I was a history major, not a math major, how many, how many beds were there for the, for this? Uh, there are 21. I was close. I had 22. I must have doubled on one. Um, so my question was: Someone referenced this as a hotel. Was it a hotel or more like a like a no, living this will like be, apartments? This will be uh, market rate apartments. Okay, okay. Um, so I I work really close to where that is, and I, the only question I don't know if it's appropriate for here. If this is a different part of your process, is for the parking because it's pretty brutal around there because. I've had to go out there and literally run cars off from the reserve spots for the museum. Um, and so I just didn't know how parking was gonna go with that because during summer, or not during summertime, but the school year, um, there's essentially no parking within several blocks of there. So I didn't know if that was, that's incorporated anywhere or if there's a plan for that. Um, so it's a mix of, uh, as far as, the, the parking that is being set up meets the UDO uh, requirements uh, for the facility. Uh, directly across the street, the developer owns uh, the city side project and the bank project that has parking garage uh, underneath it. And so some of that parking is being dedicated to this project. And then we also have a few spots under the building. Uh, those are really dedicated to the uh, retail tenant, uh, or not, I shouldn't say dedicated, but would most likely be used by. And then uh, street parking is not dedicated to this building, uh, but the UDO allows for you to count the parking that is directly adjacent to your building when looking at uh, requirements for parking counts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Elizabeth? Um, my question is, are you trying to attract students or is this for the community? 
residents in the community? I think that basically they're anyone that is interested in, in renting. Uh, this is a Kirkwood's a very desirable location. Uh, the units will be, you know, probably I would I would imagine a higher price point. Did you say the market? Uh, yeah, market is expensive. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah, you said that the rents will be high. I I'm just speculating that anything on Kirkwood costs more than if you were you know outside of the downtown yeah and and how many people per unit just one well i mean they're one they're one bedroom studio units i i guess a married couple could you know decide to rent a one bed okay all right thank you allison yeah. <laughs> I know this is really early, so I'm not going to ask a ton of questions, but uh, you're an architect, I think, correct? Yes. Okay, so architecture is part science and part art. Is that fair to say? Sure, yes. I mean, it can be Mr. very subjective. Mr. Campbell, would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> As an architect, it's part science, but it's also part art. <laughs> it's all over the place. Okay. Well, I mean, here, here's my thing. I'm, I'm just really frustrated with seeing buildings in Bloomington being built that look exactly the same. I do not consider them artfully designed in any way. I mean, they all look exactly the same. I mean, you can put gr green instead of blue, and it's that apartment complex over by the stadium. I mean, you know, like, I'm just, bleh. Okay, so um, my second question is, um, you, don't, you don't have a, a, a target market yet? When I, you were I asked did. about who you anticipate living there, I would assume that you have a target market. Yeah. You know, from, from my end, I'm, you know, looking at how to design a building. I don't really market the building. Um, well, I would, would say your target, your target market, again, is going to be whoever wants to live here that can afford the, afford the rent, whatever that number is set at. Okay. So you don't uh, consider the target market in your design process? I'm sorry, I missed part of that. You don't consider your target market as part of the design process? I mean, that's... Well, I, I would say from the standpoint of the target market is market rate development. So you're going to... With studios and one bedrooms, you're going to be targeting probably more singles um, more young professional or student, either one. Uh, okay. You'll you may get a married couple or somebody that wants to have a place to, to stay when they're in town. Uh, you know, family that might rent a rent a unit out because they they come here and travel a lot. So I'd say it's not. It's definitely not a target of we're looking for 55 and over. Mm -hmm. that no one would be discriminated against. Right. Obviously, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Yep. Answer question. Okay. Sorry. Hmm? <laughs> Hopefully you can answer or comment. Go ahead. I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, John? Hi, Tim. This is John Zodi from the Hand Department. Um, thanks for your presentation. Is this, um, does this top out at four floors or is the back addition, does that get into five floors? I just want to. Uh, so this uh, site allows for 40 feet 
which would theoretically be three levels. And then we are asking for uh, environmental incentives, mm -hmm. uh, which would include solar and, and other green incentives as part of this building package in order to get the fourth level and that would be the highest we could go here unless you went through um, incentives for affordable housing right. in which case uh, you could get a building as tall as five levels uh, the intent is to really just top out at four levels mm -hmm. and then you know that is again against the backdrop of a six level structure right that's that's kind of what i was getting at is it, it just the the scale of the second floor there i didn't know if that was two floors i thought it was one but i just didn't know if you if you uh yeah. you know if there was a fifth floor in there or if that was not there so that's uh you answer my question exactly thank you yeah the scale of the second floor is taller and that's just to get the alignment with the third level so that each each floor level is the same we don't have a Kind of a differential in height mm -hmm. the existing building even though it's two stories is a tall two-story building yeah. it's 30 feet uh, so the floor to floors on, on that building are it, it is deceiving when you're talking about it being top heavy floor one is uh, 15 feet floor two to the roof is another 15 feet each of our floor levels are 10 foot 8 on the third and the fourth floor yeah. so they're actually smaller than the floor levels of the building below it so does the back section and this will be my last comment thank you uh, is the does the is the back section taller than the front like the back addition it looks taller from this angle but is it a taller height than the no. Is it level it's no okay. it's all the I see. Yeah. Gotcha. Like in that. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. all the same height. I think the fact that this is dark and then that blue is brighter, it makes it, I don't know, perspective wise, it looks like it's popping up higher. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I have another question about actually, since you brought up color, um, is, the, is the blue or, or whatever color you use there, is that, are you trying to establish a contrast with the original building? or <clears throat> set yourself apart in some way or um yes i and i'm not married to blue um, basically we're looking at highlighting elements of the new structure whether that's in a blue or a dark gray or, or some other form that's maybe not as pronounced against the the limestone but at this point, it's more just to kind of start introducing and, and drawing some of those, um, I guess, a little, in, in my opinion, some additional interest to the facade. Yeah, I, um, in, in the interest of lightening up the, the, the upper floors, mm -hmm. um, I, and, and also in, in nodding some to some extent to the color uh, colors that are used in the original building I almost feel like if if it if that color matched the limestone or something it wouldn't be quite as distinctive but it might disappear it a little bit and I know as an architect wanting to disappear a building is a hard thing to swallow but in, yeah. in this in this case when you're when you you really need to put your effort into making clear that the historic building is the most significant thing on the lot and and you know get over trying to make the addition the most significant piece because right now i think the addition is winning and i it needs to it needs to be more subtle I, i'm not necessarily saying it needs to be fewer bedrooms but it needs to lighten up in some way and one way to do that is physically to set it back farther and another way is to is to really think through material compatibility and take your cues from the original building okay and i know with 
with this building, uh, one of the additional challenges is it's 42 feet wide and about 80 feet long. So there's not a whole lot of building there uh, as a starting point. Yeah, and, and I, I appreciate the engineering problems that and your your solutions for bringing columns through. I think all that's just fine, but um, I'm not seeing the bank here. Exactly. And I know these are renderings, and so we're sitting out here in chairs. We're not standing in front of the building, but. Um, it needs to lighten up somehow. I, I'm not exactly sure what, and that's why I said I was sorry the other two architects aren't here because I think they would help in this discussion. And obviously, this isn't the first time we're going to talk about it. So, or the only time we're going to talk about it. So, hopefully, okay. they'll, hopefully they'll be here to 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 give us their input as well. Do you feel there's uh, too much glazing on the top, or just the the mass of the of the building i, I kind of like what you've done with the glazing but what it, what the drawing forgets is that there are going to be curtains on all these windows nobody's going to be walking around up there in their skivvies <laughs> on kirkwood so the, the windows aren't they're not it's not actually going to look like that as a finished structure yeah you you will see the aluminum storefront outline um, but you're going to have a differentiation of fabric and color and lighting and things like that. So, you know, you, you know as well as we do that renderings are, you know, don't tell the whole story when once the building's inhabited. I, I don't have a problem with that per se. I like the I like the notion that it be transparent because that in a way that's a way to hide a building. That's why I was suggesting that that maybe the st the stair. Uh, column be more transparent than it is I think it would take the weight off of it um, but um, you might be able to do what I'm talking about with color and I, and I really suggest just just draw the thing 10 feet farther back and you'll see what I mean about how less intrusive it is and how less smothering it is now what you do with that 10 feet somewhere else I don't know but I'll bet you could find it you might lose a, you might even lose a couple of apartments, but you know, you, you gotta you gotta be able to see and justify that we've preserved this building before it's on its own merits. That's what we're most concerned with. Yeah, I don't think people are gonna. Sorry, do you mind if I make a comment? I don't get the sense that people are gonna walk by that. And think, oh, that was the People's State Bank building, you know, the and, and that's yeah. what you want. You know, you want people to to know that. Setback upstairs, setback up would help a lot in that regard because you won't see anywhere near that much of it once it moves back. I think is it, it fair to say though, if you're walking along the sidewalk, you're truly not going to get this kind of full perspective of the building. As no. far as if you're walking along the sidewalk, you are going to see the people's bank and... Uh, yeah, but you won't notice it as much as when you're driving down the street. Well, it depends on what side of the street you're on. That's true. That's true. Yeah. All right. Uh, is that good enough for you, Tim? Um, yeah, if there's, uh, as far as uh, general massing and glazing we talked a little bit about that it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of heartburn about either where i've built onto the building as far as pushing out to the east the south and vertically is that fair to say it's more kind of how do you make it not feel um, as big on the building well, I think that I think it's bringing out the the bank itself, the old building. For me, the the addition's too far forward on the roof. I mean, I you know I don't know how else to say it. It, it just needs to it just needs to set back farther. And okay. Let the building let the bank stick out. You know, if you will. All right. 
Anything else? Um, that's a, a great start for me. And then I'm uh, sure I will be uh, back with some adjustments and we can talk again and get some more feedback. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, our next line, our next new business was 723. Uh, 725, but the producer's not with us. Yeah, so um, Thomas Gallagher contacted me and said that he was going to hold off from from presenting for now. Okay, very good. So let's uh, move on to old business. Um, update on our photo contest. So um, you probably all know that by now from our email conversations that um, I had received all the original feedback from everybody for the first fo the photos that had been submitted and I went ahead tallied them up and I actually notified all the winners and then looking through Instagram I found three additional entries that were submitted in time and followed all the rules so what I ended up doing was sending an email back to all of you so I haven't posted anything online yet because I'm still waiting from a few more people to send me back their feedback on the new images and because I had already notified the original winners, if the new images do <laughs> come up in first, second, or third place, I will just make them co-winners. So that way it's fair for everybody who has participated and people who submitted in time and followed the rules can also be recognized. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, I haven't been able to update the Instagram yet because I'm still waiting on a, on a couple of entries, but that can be dealt with via email. Um, not entries, um, commissioner, uh, judge entries or um, submissions. And anyways, yeah, if anybody has ideas on what they would like to do for continuing education, there are some random funding opportunities that come up. I am a little bit overwhelmed right now, but I also know that the commissioners have different projects or different things that they have done or like to see um, and to throw ideas at me, feel free to email me or to ask to meet or to make a subcommittee um, to, to discuss both ideas for continuing education. We do have camp, um, the, um, oh boy, I'm terrible with acronyms, but we do have um, various continuing education opportunities coming up through conferences that will be both in person and online. I can work to register everybody, but if we want to do the traditional um, sort of uh, workshop, um, let me know so that we can start uh, coordinating with all of you. Again, I am new at this process, so any help I can get in terms of what are some topics that the HPC is concerned about would be very helpful. And yes, one thing I'm struggling with over the last two meetings um, is different priorities for different departments. Um, for example, um, our administration, as far as I understand, is is still very much interested in uh, density and housing and keep working on our affordable housing problem. Um, and then we get projects like this <laughs> and it's like wow like, like just for me personally it just doesn't feel right and I don't think that's what you were asking but you know maybe there could, yeah to talk through it because there are courses I mean, and the, uh, like the ethics and balance of densification and preservation are top are actually legitimate topics that are um, have been touched upon and because this is going to be in the news and everyone's going to I mean if we prove this and it comes out everyone's going to say oh I thought they cared about affordable housing blah 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 and now these rich kids are going to come in and live on Kirkwood right across from our, our library which is a free community you know so benefit. it just I, I'm seeing it happen I'm seeing it roll out and I'm not comfortable with it um, I will find any Legal, legal way to say no to so these people really based on the guidelines. Maybe the guidelines and what qualifies to be affordable housing with new projects? No. Okay. Um, what I'm saying is balancing our community values with historic preservation. Yeah. Because I, I t asked a question last time and I'm just like, what? 
it's yeah. yeah, it's not a new issue. It it's you're actually hitting the nail on the head on something that preservationists throughout the world have been dealing with for a long time. Okay, well, I have and um, <laughs> but it's frustrating. And actually, we do have some books on on community outreach, activism, and different things that the commissioners. We do have a small library in the HPC that the commissioners can check books out from that deal with different t sort of topics. Um, that you're welcome to, and you're also welcome to sit down and talk to me or to other people. Yeah. And we also, because part of the HPC responsibility as a certified local government mm -hmm. is to have yearly continuing education, this is a topic that we can bring in so that we can bring somebody to, to talk to us about, you know, and foster that conversation. So that actually is a very important and legitimate question. So thanks for bringing it up. It, it, part of the, and it's a good question, Allison, because I, you know, part of the reason I asked about the height is because he mentioned the affordable housing incentives. You can get another floor. Well, now we're going to be that, giving them. Well, and that's well, and it's just it's a matter of what we have, what we can work with, where, because we can't right. we can't require affordability, right? We don't, right. we're not an inclusive. It's it's illegal in Indiana, so you can only require it if you have you know other things. Right. You put you know you put things in the pot, you know, money or other incentives. So it's something we've with every project that comes across, we look at. We have a. Well, you probably know about the development review committee process mm -hmm. where every project kind of comes through the planning department and all the departments are on and we always ask about affordability and you know are you looking at it here could you do it here and if it pencils out or not and so it's it's a good it's a really i mean it is a competing set of values with our department because mm -hmm. we're trying to affordability means. yeah, yeah. Uh, based on income or rents or uh but it's um it isn't always possible for every project because of the, the cost and um, depending on the number of units. So a lot of the developments that are being considered for Kirkwood right now are under, I'd say under 30 units, mm -hmm. and that gets a lot harder uh, when you're looking at what the units are. But we can't require it. We're not an inclusive zoning. It's illegal. So you can't say no matter what, you've got to have affordability in here. So it's, <coughs> it's a dynamic problem. But yeah, there are, there are standards, but you, you have to include uh, you know, subsidies and things like that to require them. You can't just require it outright because it's, it, it's that sort of side sidetracks uh, uh, by right development. So if they adhere to the UDO standards, then they're able to build it, and you can't tell you can't pull them back and say you got to put affordable housing in here. It's illegal. I just get really frustrated too when a petitioner like that they buy the property, they know what they can make off of it, and so like they get upset if we suggest something that takes two bedrooms away and. I'm sure they've thought through all the scenarios. Like, it's you're gonna make money. Like, you know, you're gonna make money on these apartments. Like, or you wouldn't have bought it in the first place. <laughs> you know, this, I mean, this question. I mean, we're supposed to, under ordinance, um, follow follow Secretary of Interior standards and historic yeah. preservation guidelines as laid out in the ordinance. There's a whole section on compatibility. So right. the more members here understand what the ordinance provides. That's the power you have in this room, right. and and you know, you're not supposed to think about how many rooms the guy's trying to get or how much money he's going to win or lose. Right. What you're supposed right. to be thinking about is the compatibility with the bank, and the only way you can really zero in on it, it isn't so much about who's going to live here or what's your target. You know, I don't want to insult anybody. What's your target? That's not the question that we ask. The question we ask is, does this building adequately? meet compatibility standards for a historic structure. And all historic structures are different, so look, you have to look at it according to the real historic structure that's there, and you have to understand its significance in order to even have the conversation. It's, it's complicated, it's not for the light of heart, and you, all, and you really have to be able to say, no, this won't work. Right, you know, right. I was trying to gentle to him into, this, is, this building is smothering this, yeah, this historic building. What and, I'm you know, saying is, and he heard it, and he'll yeah. back it out. I'll, I guarantee you. Yeah. But will it be enough? Probably not. So we'll ask for more. But if you stick to what our guidelines are for compatibility, then you're doing the job that we're supposed to do. And you, right. you know, I have personal feelings about affordable housing too, and I, mm -hmm. I have complaints with the administration of this city ever since I've lived here for 50 years. But you know, yeah, it used yeah. to be, you know better and it used to be worse so it's never going to be I ask those questions perfect. because I want to know how much I want to dig into our guidelines and find a word that will you know yeah get us 
what we want, if that's what we want. Well, the best thing... While, while following the guidelines that we're supposed to be looking at. Does that make sense? Yeah. The like best thing for this project, <laughs> this presentation, and actually the first one Peter Horolovich is in, is to, is to keep the discussion about compatibility. Because we didn't even... I mean, I'm sorry, Gloria, but, but right. he, didn't, he didn't say one thing about that new structure. And so everybody's like, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, we have absolutely no control now over what that is going to be like, other than we have a line drawing. So my, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I see a set of guidelines that says what's allowable and what's not. That, yeah, those are ones that were adapted for that neighborhood. Right. But those aren't the same necessarily as what are in our ordinance. But don't they have to follow these guidelines are set by the committee in that district. Yes. Right, and these are they. Right, so I mean, I didn't make an issue about it because I thought these were the de facto standards by which you need to build by, so I didn't necessarily see a purpose and say what kind of siding you're using, because it mm -hmm. says what kind of siding you can and cannot use, and if you use something that is not in here, then you'll have to strip it off. So. Um, you know, we provided a diagram and a layout, and you know, within these, it's restrictive enough that it says you have this range and no more. You can build it this way and no more. But I, I kind of defaulted to this being the controls of what you can and cannot build. So well, so it, it, you can't approve what so, how something's going to get built if you can't see what's going to be built. So they, the responsibility of the petitioner is to delineate what's going, and that's the you know the sad thing about Jane's project. I mean, I felt really bad for her, but she didn't really, she didn't get it, but she didn't provide what we require, and and you know, it's up to us to take to, to not bring things to the to the board if the, the application doesn't give us the information we need to make an approval, and and. I mean, we could easily have said to Peter, now you're going to have to come back. He's, he's going to have to come back for a CLA for that house. I right. mean, does he know that? We can't. You know, we've approved that he could move a house off a site yeah. to another site, and we've approved that he could build another house. I, but, I emailed him right after the meeting to say, well, make sure you get hooked up with somebody with planning so that he's on the right path. Because he didn't... Yeah, she just didn't understand. He, he, he yeah. didn't, I don't think he kind of was dialed into the planning side. But I mean, so. even for us, he didn't give us enough information to approve that house. There. Yeah. The so. new one, yeah. Huh? The new one. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Or the changes to the old one, <laughs> for that matter. That's the one that's actually the significant one. I did want to bring a completely different issue, which I'm really glad that we had quorum today. We've had twice already this year where we haven't had quorum. And last week on the agenda, we had a full demolition for two buildings. And due to weird technicalities, that was gonna be day number 30, where we, so the COAs need to be evaluated within 30 days by the HBC, or we have to give it to them. Is that demolition yeah. or COA? So it was a certificate of appropriateness for the full demolition of two historic buildings in a historic district. And if the owner had not retracted his application two days before or three days before, I would be filling out and John would be signing a certificate of appropriateness for the full demolition of Perfect. two historic buildings in a historic district because we didn't have quorum. So I just want to let you know that the weight and the severity of the responsibilities everybody has here, yeah, even, um, and sometimes we just can't show up. We have a pandemic that just doesn't end. Um, we are, have personal lives, all of you are volunteers, and I also wanted to say thank you for being here and for showing up almost every other week because this is such a huge responsibility that you are doing on your own free time. So anyways, just wanted to let you know about the weight of, of the decisions that are made here. <laughs> uh, is it possible that we could go to um, in-person meetings? So we're technically in in-person meetings. Because the whole, like not the hybrid, but. So the thing with the hybrid is that you have to have physical quorum or you won't have quorum at all. Right, I guess I, I see an, an issue because we're all volunteers and so we can choose whether or not it's our, if, you know, I've, what was the last time? I don't even know, wedding, that's right. And then I didn't go because 
mm, there was a funeral. So well, you, you <laughs> I got out life. of town, but you I drove all the way life. to Florida yeah. anyway. But <laughs> um, but my point is that like I don't ever I don't want to be a person that misses frequently. I'm an in-person person anyway. But um, it's like it's just like this weird mystery thing of like oh well is it my turn or is it their turn or I mean if we just said we're all going to be here in person <laughs> I think it could be a little easier but and uh, everyone why are we still doing hybrid anyway? Stay, um, stay I, you want to answer? No, go ahead David. So um, bending in a legislature authorized um, uh, a way that public meetings can happen and using what's called basically a hybrid format and that's what we sort of styled it as. Uh, where certain numbers of, of commissioners can appear in person versus remotely um, to allow some more flexibility, but also I think really has the effect of, I think, improving some of the ways that the public can access these meetings. Um, each of our um, bodies have, um, as far as I'm aware, have adopted a, a specific hybrid meetings <coughs> policy. This body did it. Um, I don't have the specific date in front of me, but. Um, about the same time the city council adopted theirs and many other ones did, um, which allows you to proceed under a hybrid meeting policy. You can also opt to not proceed under a hybrid meeting for any particular meeting if you want to do that. It doesn't require you to do it. Um, I think, Mike, was this done for the pandemic? It was, I would say yes. I mean, I can't really speak for the legislature as to why specifically they did it, but it was done at that time. Um, and it followed sort of a it came about the time uh, at one point when uh, the governor was considering lifting a lot of the pandemic restrictions and lifting the emergency order which absent some kind of hybrid meetings policy would have required everyone to come back um, to the same room together. Um, that was kind of shortly before I think the Omicron variant or one of the other Delta maybe came back and started really ticking numbers back up. And um, but anyway, so they, so they pushed through um, and got a, a sort of legislative authorization for municipalities and their independent commissions and boards to put through their own hybrid meeting policies um, as long as they followed certain stat statutory requirements. Um, and so um, those were sort of adopted by the city. So, so, one, so of those, one of those policies, I believe, Daniel, was that to have a valid meeting, you had to have a quorum of, you had to have a majority of members present in person to, yeah, to maintain, or you, you can have the meeting, so that's one of the guidelines we had to, to meet. Right, but if, if I heard you correctly, there is a choice. We could say, we don't want to have hybrid anymore. We want to be here 100%. You could do that. What which that is, also, I think, which is what you're, you're alluding to. What that will also do is then require all of your petitioners as well to show up here in person too, um, if you want to have that happen. Or like, so there's just some things to think about because if you do take the hybrid way, you take it away. Right, and I mean, I think the non-hybrid version just means commissioners and petitioners. You could still have it streamed, and members of the public could still participate. It's just that the petitioners and the well, commissioners would be here. You would, you would take the Zoom away, so if they would be streaming, it would just be streaming it through the way that it's been streamed before. Okay. But, yeah, that's what we would like to do. I think, though, what John was trying to say is functionally, um, if there are nine commissioners on this board, you won't be able to have a meeting under a hybrid meetings policy unless five of you are here, which is a quorum. So if we got rid of hybrid meetings for this body with nine commissioners, five of you would still have to be here. If there were four of you that could be here, if you could zoom in and add input, they wouldn't be allowed to do that anymore. So you would potentially lose some input from commissioners who may otherwise not be able to be physically present for a meeting. So to so the extent possible, we need to encourage all voting and non-member, especially voting, to be here in person as much as possible. The, the, the virtual option is it's a little perilous because we could we risk losing quorum if one of you decided to go virtual today we would have lost quorum and we couldn't have the meeting so we need to encourage all all members especially voting members to be here or we, we can't have a meeting that's that's the 
That's the rub with all this, is that we... Back in the good old days. I'm sorry? I remember back in the good old days, everybody had to turn up for Zoom hybrid. Right, but then we didn't have the Zoom, so the public, the benefit, the sort of the balance you're weighing is that the public would lose, you know, the uh, ability to publicly the comment. The solution is you miss a certain number of meetings, you get replaced. I mean, yeah. you're obviously not serious if, really if you're going to be absent. Yeah. I think that would be, you know, that so, would be a procedural thing that I don't know if the, how that ties in with the, 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 with the municipality. So hybrid option allows the public to participate, you know, if they're elsewhere or but it also, it, it gives commissioners the option, and what I think Gloria is getting at too, if I may, is that we just really need to try to tell commissioners that it's really, you need to, be you, you need to try to be here in person, because we're really, we get, we get pretty dicey, and it's the same for other commissions, not just this one, but it gets really dicey when you're really hoping one person doesn't, you and know, we, we come down with something, or, and, or you're, you're yeah. messed and we, up. We can have a conversation in it of, if, are we meeting too much, too frequently? Is it too much of a burden for commissioners? But we also have so many certificates of appropriateness applications that are coming in, uh, streaming in constantly. Uh, already for next week, we have 10 stacked up for the next meeting, not next week, next meeting. Two of those were staff approval, so it's eight. <laughs> but it's still, you know, like, and it, last year, I had just arrived and, Maybe it was just the pandemic petering out for a bit and things reopening, but we had some nights where there were 13 to 17 and, our, and meetings that were four hours or longer. So it, it all depends on you, but I, I also want to throw those questions out there. What works best for the commission? Because you are all human beings who are sacrificing your time, your, your intelligence, and your, you know, your, you're sacrificing a lot to be here and make these really critical decisions that change the landscape of Bloomington daily. You know, you walk outside and you see a new sign, you see uh, a, the addition, you see the demolition. So, yeah. I, I would, I was surprised that this body met so frequently. I'm not complaining, I was just surprised. Um, but I understand that if you have monthly meetings and sometimes you miss the door for that 30 days, so. I would, I, I, I would rather come here, I mean, this wasn't like a ridiculous long meeting and bang it out than, you know, go once a week, because um, there's a couple meetings where we had business for five minutes, <laughs> you know, so. Well, I think they all have to be notified, too, you know, through the paper and everything that we are having those That's meetings. That's true, yeah, so that might cut down and, I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of work for Gloria to prepare. For meetings, and the more frequently you do that, less. Yeah, the turnaround work. time is exactly two weeks. A week before the <laughs> meetings, the packets and the agenda have to go out. As of late, I have taken a little longer because there have been some staff reports that have taken longer. And yes, there are things. Um, I also want to sit down and revise the instructions as well because the range of things that people submit are so varied. Mm -hmm. that we have people who want to change a downspout versus and that and that could be a manufacturer specs and then you have something medium like the porch which is true like a plan would have been been ideal i've also you behind the scenes and i'm speaking publicly and i'm not going to name petitioner names because all of this is recorded on cats and i want to preserve privacy but behind the scenes i do spend hours talking to people mm -hmm. and if they don't some they will submit everything except one thing and they will be here because they will be here. And so I'm kind of stuck in a situation where either I sit down and do the drawings for them and I do not have the time no. for that, or, or I present sometimes some drawings that are questionable and, and so I, and then there are full plans and then there are small, there's multiple mm -hmm. scales. And so I have a fence and I have a new construction and a demolition and all these things are being, submitted i have people who submit things and then i have to call them and say hey you haven't met with me we haven't even spoken what the heck i know you've submitted a million times before but we need to sit down and talk 
So there is a lot of going on. And then there's everything else that you don't see. I need to include in the packet, if you want to, the programmatic agreement renewal, renewal. The HPC is going to be commenting on that. You have 30 days to do that. So that will be in your next packet as well. The programmatic agreement renewal is section 106 um, issue that comes up with the state. And we are at a renewal right now. And it's one of the like heavier things that my office does behind the scenes, which is not is both HPC related and not. So there's a lot of other things that go on behind the scene that never make it to this. So I just want to let you know that, that. that there's um, a lot going on. So I have a question for you. Is it, it, we had, in the past, we have, uh, I thought we had a stipulation that if you, if you submit a C of A, you, until you go through those processes, it does not come to this board. If somebody doesn't show up for that meeting, they're not on the next agenda. That, yeah. And and we limited it to a number, a certain number of C of A's per meeting. I they accept that the certain number of C of A's per, per meeting is not in any instructions I have. And remember that I also arrived two months after Connor left, so I wasn't able to ask him. Okay. Hey, like, okay. when do I stop accepting? I've been trying to get people to sign up for two meetings ahead. Uh, but people are always saying, like, I need to have my permit right now. Like, I'm going to no, turn it I, in right I mean, now. I mean, and that's when I meet with them, so. <laughs> you know, I can tell you that I need to get my car washed, too. But, I mean, we, we just have to stick to the stuff that is yeah. pertinent and, and control how much, how long the meeting lasts for our own sanity. Ooh, as, that's as, fair. As well as just to get the, get the project out in the right way. Right. Because that's when fair. stuff shows up. Like this, I'll just say the porch thing again. The stuff shows up, and we don't have the evidence that we need in order to make a just decision for this woman. And I'm, 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 I can say with almost 99% assurance that we would have approved it, yeah. because what all the things she was saying were, were the right things. She just didn't have the evidence that we need. So there's just no way she should have been at this meeting without that. And, and that goes for anybody. And then I know Nancy Easton used to keep a list when the call came in, I need a, you know, I want to submit a C of A. She had a list and every, there was a date on every phone call and people got in line. And the first, the top seven or eight on that list got to go to that next meeting and the next were scheduled for the next one and the next and the next. And some of them were months out. Okay. But, you know, the business was handled in a way that, that satisfied people and, and they got they got what they needed, and yeah, they had to wait. And I, it's inconvenient, and, but it's no it's no less inconvenient than planning, where you can, you know, I mean, yeah. the county planning. If you want to get a if you want to get a historic designation, it's a six month process because it's got to go all the way through planning before it goes to the commissioners. Maybe you can ask those people if they think we need more taxes to pay our employees and get more employees. <laughs> but I mean, it makes it, you know. It, it, it unburdens the board in, in some ways because they know, okay, it's going to be a reasonable amount of time. But it's really frustrating, and I, I'm not just putting this on you. I honestly am not. But it's very frustrating if the evidence isn't there that you need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And now we wasted 45 minutes with her porch. Completely wasted. <laughs> and she's pissed. <laughs> she's mad. She'll be hard. Yeah, she will. But, I mean, we don't. You don't, you know how many people come to the board and say historic preservation is – is a bad thing. It takes an extra step. We yeah, got to, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And then the next time the designation for AME Church comes up or anything like that, there are all these naysayers who are like, oh, another preservationist. Well, it's so experience. the more people you make unhappy, the worse it is for us. Yeah. And it was a learning experience for her, and she was older. She just didn't understand. I, I know, but, she, but it's our job to, to make everybody understand before they come in here. It isn't our job to explain to them what the, how the process is supposed to work. Yeah. So is there like somewhere we can talk to you Okay, I know my family's going to have Yeah. Yeah, I think we just need to make sure that we're here with uh, you know, all of our legal timelines are prepared. So that we can and also, like... 30 days and, and that we just need to have a you know, procedure set in place. Can so. I move to adjourn? I made my kids sit in the car long yeah. enough waiting for me for dinner. We actually yeah. have no other form, so we're... You're your we're really okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'd love to have this discussion, but they've been sitting there for like 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye-bye. It was been just a meeting for... Um... <clears throat>
I don't think we have any more commissioner comments at this point. Uh, I don't think we have any public left at this point. So let's adjourn the meeting.